Good morning, everybody. Thank you for once again allowing me to come into your homes. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. And what a privilege it is for us to be able to gather together to worship our Lord and to bring praise to his name. Just as we start our service, just uh, one or two announcements. The first is, and uh, just because many of you will ask, um, we've had a little bit of a tough week as far as little Sophie is concerned. Uh, her health deteriorated and uh, there was uh, she, we had to increase the amount of medication that she needed just to keep her going. And it reached the point that we had to make the very tough decision to let her go. And uh, our hearts are sad, but we're comforted in the fact that she had the maximum quality of life that she could have. And uh, Jedediah is missing her, but uh, we will we will soldier on. And then I do want to remind you uh, to send me your selfie photos so that I can keep working on our collage. I received a few more this week. So your selfies and your assies, uh, please do send those to me. I'd love to put our collage together. So please do send those to me. And then many of you have been asking uh, whether, whether we're going to start resuming church services. And our elders are meeting in, in 10 days time. We're just wanting to look at what the statistics do in the next uh, little while. And there is also talk that the... Uh, churches are meeting with the president and that there may well be a shift in the legislation. And so as soon as all of that is clear, we'll make a decision. But for now, we will continue with our services online. And I do encourage you to connect to your church family and, and make contact with those that you would normally be in contact with. We also have a number of fellowship groups that you can be part of and join in with. And I do encourage you to do that. Our theme for this morning's service is the theme of rebuilding. And so in the various background pictures that you see, there'll be uh, the, the, the motif for the theme of rebuilding. We will be thinking of the rebuilding of Israel after they return from the exile, but also looking at Psalm 127. Our call to worship comes from Matthew 16 where Jesus has asked the disciples who they think he is, and Peter makes the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus announces that this confession of Peter's, and not Peter, but his confession, will be the bedrock of the church. And he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's worship God together. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, we gather together as your children. And as we've enjoyed the contrasts of weather this week, cold in the beginning and then spring-like weather in the second half of the week, we marvel in awe and wonder at the diversity and beauty of all that your hands have made. And we praise you, Creator God, God of the universe, God of majesty and might. We worship you, Holy God, True God, Faithful God, God without beginning, God without end, God of justice, God of truth, but also God of mercy. And Father, we are in need of your mercy because in our humanity and humanness, we have failed you in so many ways. In our stubbornness and in our pride, we have gone against your word and against your ways. We have let ourselves down, we have let one another down. And we confess, Lord, that we are not worthy to enter into your presence, but we are grateful that through the blood of Christ, we are forgiven and we are set free. And so we confess us unto you. Hear us as we confess in the silence of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that there is indeed forgiveness in and through the name of Jesus. Thank you that you do not hold our sins against us, but that we are set free through the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. Help us to live according to our forgiveness and according to the love that you have shown us. Fill us with power by your Spirit that we might walk and act in your love and in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This morning I want to tell you about the Cathedral of Notre Dame. It is a beautiful church in, in France, in, in, in Paris, and it's built nearby the Eiffel Tower. And it is a place where Christians have worshipped, not just for years, but for centuries. This beautiful uh, cathedral that you can see on your screen now was in the news last year, just after Easter, or just before Easter, actually, during Holy Week, when on Monday, the 15th of April, the news was filled with reports that the Notre Dame Cathedral was on fire. And if you look on the screens now, you can see some of those pictures of the devastating fire that went through that cathedral. And everybody was so devastated and so sad 
And they were right to be sad and devastated because it really is a beautiful and historic building. And very, very, people were very sad that the artwork and the beauty of that cathedral had been so badly damaged. But one of the questions I asked myself is, just because this cathedral has burnt, does that mean that we can't worship God? Does it mean, do we need a building to be able to worship God? And of course, the answer is no, we don't. And we've proved that during this lockdown time because we haven't been able to go to church, but we have been able to worship God. Now, we know that they, we will be able to go back to church at some point, and we know that they're busy rebuilding the Notre Dame Cathedral. And we know that even in spite of the fire and the damage it was caused, a lot of the cathedral was not damaged. And we're very grateful for that. But what's exciting for me is that when it comes to worshiping God, we can pray anywhere. We can read the Bible anywhere. We can show love to people anywhere. We can show acts of kindness to people anywhere. Boy, boys and girls, sometimes we need to remember that the church is not a building as much as what the church is people. And we are the church. And wherever we are, we take the church with us. And so while we are very grateful to have cathedrals that inspire us and, and help us to think of God's goodness and God's kindness, and while it's nice to be able to worship together in cathedrals or even in our own beautiful Emmanuel building, the wonderful thing is that God is with us wherever we go, whenever we go. Lord Jesus, help us to be your followers wherever we find ourselves. In Jesus' name, Amen. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a song. Our scripture reading is going to be taken from Psalm 127. Now, Psalm 127 is part of the uh, collection of psalms that are called the Songs of Ascent. 
And there are two theories about these psalms. The one theory is that they were collected during the time that the Israelites were returning from the exile. So coming back from Babylon and Persia, back to the promised land, they collected 15 psalms as they saw Jerusalem in the distance and ascended up because Jerusalem is on a hill. These songs reminded them of the lessons that they had learned during their captivity, their exile, and now their return. The other theory is that King Hezekiah was on his deathbed when he asked God for extra time. And when God gave him the promise of extra time, the sun moved back 15 steps on the staircase that Hezekiah could see from his sickbed. And that that became so significant for him that he collected these 15 psalms to record the lessons that he had learned as God gave him this extra time. In practice, regardless of the origin of these songs, these songs were sung by bands of Israelites as they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the major religious feasts of Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. And then, to make Psalm 127 more interesting, Psalm 127 is the central psalm of the Songs of Ascent. There are seven Songs of Ascent before this one and seven afterwards. The other thing that's interesting about it is that this song has the additional title, not only is it a song of ascent, but it is also subtitled of Solomon. Now that could mean that the song was by or for or about Solomon. And there is some, there are some interesting theories about that. Most of the scholars agree that it wasn't that Solomon wrote this song, but rather that the psalm has a, a phrase in it, the phrase beloved or the one that he loves. And that phrase is Jedediah. Yes, you heard right. That's the same name as we have for our cat. And Jedediah means beloved of the Lord. And when Bathsheba was pregnant with Solomon, God sent Nathan the prophet to David to say, I want you to call this child Jedediah. Because he is loved by me. And we know that Solomon started his kingship well. When God met with him and asked him what he wanted, he didn't ask for wealth or riches or fame or, or, or renown. Instead, he asked for wisdom. And God promised to bless him because of this vital or principal decision that he had taken. And we know that Solomon's reign began well. Unfortunately, his reign did not end well. By the end of his life, Solomon had become consumed with materialism. He had hundreds of wives and concubines. And after his death, under his own son's reign, the kingdom would be torn in two. And so many see this psalm as a wisdom psalm, a psalm that reflects on Solomon, but, but maybe in some ways a corrective to the mistakes that Solomon had made. And so as we look at this psalm, there is much for us to learn from it. Let's bear in mind that this collection of 15 psalms became very prominent at the time that Israel returned from exile. Now the return from exile was the time of Nehemiah and Ezra and the prophet Haggai. It was Nehemiah who told the, the Israelites that they needed to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. It was Haggai who told the Israelites that they needed to rebuild the temple. This was a time of getting priorities right. This was a time of rebuilding. And maybe in our time of rebuilding after COVID-19, this psalm has tremendous relevance for us. And so reading our scriptures this morning all the way from the UK, is our missionary, Janice Taylor, who is going to be reading the scriptures for us. Psalm 127, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem, a psalm of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. 
It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would bring you praise and glory and honour now and forevermore. Amen. If I gave you an opportunity to write down the lessons that you have learned during this COVID lockdown period and as we go into our rebuilding phase, I wonder what those lessons would be. I jotted down a few. A couple of the positive lessons that I've learned. I think we've all learned the value of family. And I think many of us have come to appreciate our family and, and our close friends and relatives and how important our relationships are. Secondly, I think we've learned the value of some of the professions that we've taken for granted. We realize during lockdown the importance of those who grow our food, who collect our food, who manufacture our food, who pack our food on the shelves. We've learned the value of our essential services, our doctors, our nurses, and even the people who take away our garbage. I think we've learned the value of slowing down. And I think we've learned that a lot of our life had become a rat race and that a, that a lot of the things that we con considered absolutely essential turned out to be pretty non-essential. On the negative side of things, I think there have been a couple of other lessons that we've learned. We've learned how fragile our economy and our society can be. We've learned that fear, cynicism, stereotypes and fake news can be very dangerous to us. I think we've also learned the temptations of becoming insular and disconnected and how dangerous that can be. Now we're in level two of lockdown and I'm hoping that level one is just around the corner and trusting that the Lord will be gracious to us and bring healing to our land. And in this time, we have to start the task of rebuilding, rebuilding our communities, our economies, our society. And there are a large number of challenges in front of us. And there are some lessons that I think Psalm 127 teaches us that we need to learn. And so I'm going to go through them. And the Psalm really divides into two parts. The first part describes the building blocks of society. And the second part describes the heart of everything. So let's start with verses 1 and 2, which are the building blocks. And the building blocks can be described in three simple words, home, society, and work. And when we look at our lives, our lives pretty much revolve around those three things. Let's start with the home. Somebody once said, a house does not a home make. And in Hebrew, the word for house is bait. It's also the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And a bait or a bait really describes not just a building, but a shelter, a place of safety, a cocoon of warmth and security. Now, we can live at the right address and we can have the right fittings, but it might still not be our home. The psalmist warns us that if we build houses, but we don't have God as our foundation and God as our guiding principle, if God is not part and parcel of all that we do, then our house could be something that has been built in vain. For it to be a home, God needs to be at the center of our lives. When it comes to society, 
What's interesting for me is the psalmist's take on society. What would you hope for society? If I asked you, what is your best wish for society? Some might say that they would want society to prosper. Others would say they want society to advance. Others would say that a society that embraces technology or uh, whatever it is that they think of, that that would be a healthy society. Interestingly enough, for the psalmist, the value of society or the cornerstone of society hinges around the safety of society. And so it talks about the watchman. And the Hebrew word that occurs here, shamar, which is about being a watchman or a guard or a protector, is a word that is used often in the Old Testament and, and appears in Psalm 121 and numerous other psalms. And the idea around safety and protection here is about the wholeness and welfare and security of society. And the psalmist longs for a society that is safe. And he says, you can appoint as many soldiers and as many policemen as possible. But that society will not be safe until God's values are upheld in that society. And it's interesting that corruption sabotages the very fabric of society. When leaders cheat, the average citizen has no reason to live an upright life. And so society becomes an unsafe place, an insecure place, a place that is in desperate need of safety. If we want our society to be safe, we need God to be part of our society. The third area that the psalmist identifies as a building block is the area of work. And work is such a difficult thing. Many people complain about work. Many people find work stressful and challenging. Many of us just think about holidays and, and work being the thing that we do to kind of keep the pot cooking. But in fact, work is one of the, the great privileges that we've been given and one of the ways in which we reflect the image of God because God is at work in our world and he sustains creation he worked in the, the, the creation of the world, but he also works in your and my lives. And when we work in, in, the, in the way that God wants us to, we participate in, in his nature and in his purpose for our lives. However, work often becomes a toxic thing. And that is when we work for ourselves, by ourselves, through ourselves, for ourselves, and, and for our own purposes. And very often work becomes an idol or work even becomes a slave master or a slave driver that holds us captive and, and robs us of sleep. And this idea of sleep is a very powerful image in the psalmist's mind. And he talks about how when we work outside of God, when we do our work outside of God's purpose for our lives and God's plan for our lives, then work will rob us of sleep. But if we find ourselves in the center of God's will, if we find our identity in God, then work can become something that doesn't rob us of sleep, but in fact prepares us for a good night of sleep. And there is nothing better than a good sleep after a good day's work. And all of us have had that experience from time to time. But what is our core identity? And here the psalm offers us a beautiful word. It's the word Jedidiah. Yes, and that's, our, that's the name of our cat. And the, 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 the name means beloved of the Lord. And this is the name that God gave to Solomon even before he was born. It's a name given not on the basis of our performance or our achievement, but rather the fact that we are unconditionally loved. By God, we are His. And He values us and our lives have purpose because of His love for us. When we approach work from this basis, that we don't have to earn the love that God gives us, when we don't have to earn respect, when we don't have to earn value, but that we are valued and are loved, 
and are gracious in the sight of God, then our work can become an extension of God's plan for our lives and something that gives us meaning and purpose. And so these three building blocks, the home, society, and work, when these are centered on God and founded in God, and when God is the foundation of these three building blocks, then life begins to make sense. But it's almost as though the psalmist knew that when we start talking about work, that can very easily become the rabbit hole that swallows us. And so he pulls us away from work back to the most important value of all. And this is the value of family. And here I'm not only talking about biological family, but also our spiritual family and, and the family that we build for ourselves through our friendships and our relationships. And it's almost as though the psalm wants to say to us, we really have no value all by ourselves. That our true value comes when we are in community, in family. And the psalmist says, children are a gift and a reward and a blessing from God. And once again, when we use the word reward, it's not the reward that, that we've deserved it, but rather a reward that God gives us simply because he loves us. Simply because he values us and trusts us. That he places the lives of little children or the lives of the pupils that we teach or the people that we mentor or the people that we guide through life. He places them in our lives as a gift and as a privilege. And that our lives have meaning when we extend ourselves on behalf of those who must follow in our footsteps. The psalmist says, children are arrows in our quiver. Now, of course, the Old Testament context is, is the uh, tribal context. And there, of course, sons were seen as valuable because they could physically defend a family. But today we understand that, that all our children are valuable, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, regardless of their skills and their gifting. That they are the arrows that we fire into the future. They are the ones who will transform the future. They are the ones that will impact the future. They are the legacy that we will leave. We fire them into the future and they make a difference. They make our society strong. And our society and 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 we are nurtured and protected by our children. And the psalmist finishes with this image that when, when a person has children who can defend them at the city gate, then they are truly blessed. Now, the city gate was the place where legal happenings would take place. And so if you were ever taken to court or if you were in ever, ever in any kind of trouble at the city gate, it was your family that gathered around you, your family that was the testimony that, that you were an upright person. They were the ones that upheld you and stood beside you and walked through trouble with you. And the idea is that when we live in families, biological and relational families, we bolster a strong and healthy society. When society is made up of rugged individualists, society breaks down. But society that treasures strong bonds is a strong society. And so the psalmist gives us this picture of, of a community that is being rebuilt. And to rebuild, we need good homes, good society, and a good approach to work. And all of that centers on our relationship with God and the need for us to be beloved, that we recognize that we are the beloved. That Christ came and died for us. That we are valuable and precious in his sight. And if we think of the three contexts that this psalm alludes to, we think of Solomon. Solomon started well, but got sucked away from core family to materialism and this, these many wives. 
and, and this loose connectedness. And it was disastrous for him. We think of Hezekiah, who by the time he was going to die had no children. And so when God gave him extra, extra years, he then became a dad, but then lost focus and also built stables and all sorts of things so that his son Manasseh became one of the most evil kings Israel ever had. Hezekiah also dropped the ball. The third picture that we have is the Israelites returning from the promised land. Or returning to the promised land, should I say. And they come back and they need to get their building blocks right. What will they do first? Haggai has to say to them, but you're building paneled houses for yourselves, but you haven't remembered the Lord. Nehemiah has to remind them to build the city walls. And if you watch how he builds those walls, he does it by pulling communities together through prayer and through worship. Our society needs to rebuild itself. We as the church will be part and parcel of that. As we rebuild, the temptation will be to throw ourselves into the work, to throw ourselves back into building our businesses and, and bolstering our incomes and throwing ourselves back into school work and varsity work and deadline work. And, and before we know it, the rat race could be on us all over again. This psalm, the central psalm of ascent, calls us to keep the Lord in the center of our focus. And so there are three key thoughts. Number one, don't build a house, a city, or your work without God. Secondly, remember that you are Jedediah. You are beloved of God. And number three, remember that children, spiritual children and physical children, are our ultimate legacy. And our lives are best lived when we invest into others. It's my prayer that this will be the kind of society we build. Morning everyone. While we must be together and cannot take up an offering like we normally do, it is important for us to give ourselves to God because every good gift we have comes from Him. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we dedicate all we are and all we have to you this day. Help us to show and share your love with others. We praise you for Jesus Christ and we open ourselves to him, that we might know him personally and follow him in all of our lives. Amen.
Jesus instituted this meal for us. And he reminded the disciples to do this whenever we ate and drank. We did this in remembrance of him. And this meal at its heart is a reminder to you and me that we are loved. When we struggle, when we doubt, when our faith goes through a dip, when we struggle with a sense of our own failure or our, 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 our inadequacy, then this meal is a reminder that Christ died for us. The bread reminds us that his body was broken for us. The cup of wine or grape juice reminds us that his blood was shed for us. As we partake of this meal, we are being reminded that we are much loved. And so we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and wine and set these everyday elements apart from their normal use to this holy use and mystery. And as he drew near to the Father in prayer, having taken bread and wine, we draw near to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come into your presence. We thank you for your incredible love, your goodness to us, and your faithfulness. Thank you that you have provided and guided and led us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price that you paid on the cross for us, that you hung there out of love for a broken humanity. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that it is you that whispers in our hearts reminds us that we are children of the Father, that we can call God Abba, Father. And so, Father, Son, and Spirit, we praise and adore you. And with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, not as we ought, but only as we are able, do we give you thanks for your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would rest on us and these gifts of bread and wine in every home that the bread that we break would be to us the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup that we bless may it be to us the communion of the blood of Christ, that as we eat and drink, even in our separate locations, we would be partakers of your body and blood to our spiritual benefit and our growth in grace. We commit ourselves to you, asking that you would help us to live as, as sacrifices to you, holy and pleasing, to will and act according to your purpose and your plan. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so, according to the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in remembrance of him, we do this, who on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, as you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. 
I invite you at home to pass the bread around. If everybody would just break off a piece of bread and have it in readiness. And I'll just allow a moment for that and then we'll eat together. So, take and eat. The body of Christ was broken for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup and said, Take and drink. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, you have met us at this table and you have reminded us that we are Jedediah. We are beloved. We thank you for this incredible privilege that regardless of our track record, regardless of our performance, regardless of our mistakes and failures, we are loved by you. And we pray that you would help us to offer this love to the world around us. And we pray for our world, Father. We pray for our leaders who make important decisions as our infection rates decrease, as society needs to return back to, to work and to school and to university. We pray, Father, for those whose jobs are uncertain. We pray for those who face health challenges. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who have been impacted by the coronavirus and by the economy and by the challenges that our society faces. Lord, we lift them to you and we ask you to give them the strength and the courage, the guidance and the assistance that they will need. Finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, asking that you would walk with us in the week that lies ahead. Help us to build with you that we would do nothing on our own, but everything with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When
Thank you for being with us this morning. As we move into our future, it is my prayer that these core values that Psalm 127 has given us will be the core values with which we rebuild our society. May we be strong on family. May we be a society that holds the values of God close to our hearts. And as we work, may we work as those who know that they are loved. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. Amen. Tuesday the 8th, it is Wendy Majeni's birthday. And here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. Today, Sunday the 6th, Margie Skumon, Henri John Cook, Laco Emmanuel Marcel, who is turning 12, Sandra Conradi. On Monday, Margaret Nicol, Denise Teague and Anton Olsen. On Tuesday the 8th, Michael Bradbury and Gareth English. On Wednesday the 9th, Madeleine van Meyeren, Lisa Pelser, Duma Gubevo, Jaren Gruppo who is turning 17, Evelyn Shivora and Rowan Boota who is turning 9. On Tuesday, Lengiwe Setole and Anne McCullum. On Friday the 11th, Tsipisu Barker is turning 11. And on Saturday the 12th, Aaron Fortenton is turning 7 and Garnet Gunieri is also celebrating a birthday. There are two anniversaries. On Wednesday the 9th, Brenda and George Watson, all of 59 years. And on Friday the 11th, Tanya and Andrew Dinwoody, 21 years. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that in these times when we cannot always be with the people we love on our special days, we can rejoice in knowing that you are always with us and that you want us to be close to you. Thank you for loving these people who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, for guiding them, caring for them, protecting them. As you are close to them, please draw them close to you in the here ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 